welcome everyone uh, to this exciting conversation on democracy, race, and justice in the 21st century. It's great to see so many people here. Um, my name is Beverly Gage. I'm a history professor here at Yale, and I'm also the director of the Brady Johnson Program in Grand Strategy, which is sponsoring this series. I want to say a few words about why we're doing that, um, because I think they will maybe help to shape the conversation here, and then I will introduce our two distinguished guests, and we will really just have a conversation. Um, the format here is that we're just going to talk up here for a little bit uh, between the three of us, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A from the floor. Um, the reason that we are having this kind of event, which is really, as I said, a moderated conversation, a conversation on stage, and a conversation with all of you, is that it gets at one of the aims of the Grand Strategy Program, which is to combine the knowledge that people get in the academy, uh, from professors, being students, and try to put that knowledge in conversation in new ways with uh, folks who are out there in the world, uh, being practitioners, making making decisions on the ground, kind of living particularly the political challenges of this moment day to day. That's something we try to do a little bit in the grand strategy class, and we wanted to bring that conversation to the wider campus as well. Um, the other two purposes behind this new event series, which is titled The Big Picture, so it might suggest a little bit of what we had in mind, is that we thought in a moment like the one that we're all living through, in which the news cycle seems to change every day, if not every hour, um, in which many people seem to be living in a kind of constant sense of crisis, wondering what the next thing is that's going to happen, there's a real need for moments when you can step back and think about the quote unquote big picture, think about where we really stand in history over a slightly longer time arc than just the last couple of years, but as importantly to think about where we want to be over the long haul as a society, as a nation, um, as a world, and to have a moment to really just project ahead uh, around those sorts of questions. Um, the last purpose behind this kind of conversation is to provide a little bit of an opportunity to think not only about what and where we are and where we might want to go, but also the question of how we get there. And that is a sort of fundamental question of strategy. It's something that we talk about a lot in the grand strategy class and the grand strategy program. But if we have a vision, for some other order, some other world, some other politics. Um, what are the ways that we can think about for making that happen? What are the ways that people in the past have thought about doing that? Um, and how can we start to put those pieces together? So that's really the purpose of this series overall. As I said, um, today we are going to be talking about the rather large questions of uh, democracy, race, and justice in the 21st century, probably also some in the 20th century and maybe even in the 19th and 18th century. We'll see how far, uh, how far back we go in the conversation. I am delighted to uh, welcome both James Foreman and Vanita Gupta here. Um, many of you know James Foreman is a distinguished law professor at Yale, the J. Skelly Wright Professor of Law at Yale, and he is author most recently of Locking Up Our Own Crime and Punishment in Black America, which among many other uh, awards and moments of praise um, was the recipient of the 2018 Pulitzer Prize in general nonfiction. And if you haven't read the book, I highly recommend it, not only for what it has to say about the history of criminal justice and mass incarceration in the United States. It's really a book about Washington, D.C. in particular and the ways in which uh, urban politics, the politics of crime beginning in the 60s and 70s helped to produce uh, the crisis of over-policing and mass incarceration uh, that really took off in the 90s and into the 2000s. And so it's a great policy book. It's a fascinating policy book, but it is also a deeply human book. Um, it is a book about people and the good decisions they make and the bad decisions that they make, and that applies to just about everyone in the book, from people who end up uh, locked up, either rightly or wrongly, to many of the politicians and policymakers, many of them uh, black politicians and policymakers, who in response to a variety of factors in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, um, got on board with certain kinds of law and order politics 
and found that it produced consequences uh, that were quite detrimental. So one of the things that we talk about um, in the grand strategy class a little bit is the history of unintended consequences, is the history of how you know when you're making the right decision and how you begin to measure that. And this is uh, a beautiful, eloquent, as well as uh, politically insightful um, book in part about that question. Uh, Professor Foreman is a graduate of Brown University and of Yale Law School. After graduating from Yale Law School, he clerked for Judge William Norris of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and for Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, um, an interesting moment in which his own uh, political views may or may not have aligned with the person that he was working for. Um, he joined the Public Defender Service and worked there uh, for many years in Washington, D.C., helped to found a charter school in Washington that now uh, operates in juvenile prisons, uh, in juvenile jails in D.C. Um, for students uh, who have been incarcerated and had dropped out of high school. Um, he taught at Georgetown Law School from 2003 to 2011, and since 2011, he has been back here um, at Yale teaching a variety of courses from uh, constitutional law, criminal justice law, to a course in which uh, Yale Law students and the occasional undergraduate as well um, actually work with um, and learn with and teach with uh, students in a Connecticut prison. Uh, I also want to welcome Vanita Gupta, in this case, back to Yale. Um, I did not know when I invited her to uh, participate in this conversation that she is a uh, 1996 graduate of Yale, is in fact a history major. Am I right, history major? Yeah, so I'm always very excited as a history professor when like history majors take what they learn and then they go out and they change the world and do all of these transformative things. Um, at the moment, she is the president and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, which has has an interesting history of its own, it was an organization founded in 1950 really by some of the towering figures of the labor and civil rights movement, most notably A. Philip Randolph, uh, the creator of the, the founder of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters in the 1920s, uh, who went on to also be one of the great uh, visionaries and architects behind the modern civil rights movement. Um, the purpose of the organization today is in part to take a lot of different progressive organizations organizations with a lot of different agendas, everyone from uh, the ACLU to the NAACP um, to organizations working around uh, gay rights, working around uh, immigrant rights, and try to see, and she can correct me if I'm getting any of this wrong, uh, if everyone can get together uh, on the same page and speak at least sometimes with a single voice. Um, she too has a long history working in the area of civil rights and human rights. Um, she's a graduate uh, not only of Yale, but of NYU Law School. Um, she went on from law school to work as the deputy legal director and director of the Center for Justice at the ACLU, as well as previously to that, the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. She has been involved in uh, some of the most dramatic civil rights cases of our time, um, beginning with the overturning of the wrongful convictions of 38 people uh, in Tulia, Texas, uh, one of her first big cases. Um, and perhaps most notably for us, from 2014 to 2017, she was head of the Civil Rights Division in the Department of Justice in the final years of the Obama administration and worked widely in areas ranging from policing and criminal justice to reform, to disability rights, to hate crimes, to voting rights, and hopefully we'll have a chance uh, to touch on all of these today. I want to mention a few, uh, a few things that she did at the DOJ that you might want to talk about and that hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about. Um, as head of the Civil Rights Division, she helped to investigate the Ferguson and the Chicago Police Departments. Um, she led challenges to the Texas and North Carolina uh, voter ID laws and to uh, many of the transgender laws, particularly in North Carolina uh, that came up in the last couple of years. Um, so please join me in welcoming these two extraordinary people, James Foreman and Vanita Gupta, up to the stage and we'll begin our conversation. Go ahead. All right, well, um, I said up there that part of our purpose here, does this sound okay? Uh, levels are okay, okay. Um, is to do a little bit of big picture thinking around these very big words that we've taken as our mission for this afternoon. Um, so I thought maybe I would start out just 
uh, with a question to you, Vanita, which is that, so I'm a historian, you're a history major, um, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about the ways in which your organization uh, had a vision in 1950, what it's doing today, but particularly I think we're at a moment in time where many people who care about these words, democracy, race, justice, think we're living in pretty bleak times, think we might be living in times in which we're somehow uh, going back to a, uh, a less enlightened past in which uh, challenges that we thought from the past had been laid to rest are now coming up again. So I wonder if you might just think in a little bit of historical perspective about where we stand in history and where your, where your organization is right now. Sure, um, and it's great to be here. I was just telling Beverly that I haven't been back in Harkness since in 20 years and I'm getting flashbacks of all the classes I took, but I did find my way here. And there wasn't a grand strategy program at the time that I was an undergraduate and I'm a huge fan of James's and always look forward to being in conversation with him. So really glad to be here today. So um, the Leadership Conference, as you said, was founded in 1950, and it was really forged by Jewish labor and African-American leaders who, at the time in 1950, there had been a long campaign and would still be a long campaign to fight for the Voting Rights Act. Um, but it was forged out of this notion that the fight for civil rights couldn't be won by one group alone, but would need to be waged in coalition. And really, I think part of that was out of the recognition that folks particularly African-Americans in the South were literally dying for the right to vote. Uh, and the power that needed to be assembled to move a very entrenched racist uh, Congress to get to a place to enact the Voting Rights Act would need to be power assembled across communities and across organizations deploying the power of the labor movement, of uh, the faith movement, and of the civil rights movement. And you know, in a lot of ways, I will say, you know, when I was leaving the Justice Department kind of with a pretty keen eye about what was going to happen given how the president had campaigned and, um, and with the nomination of Jeff Sessions, uh, really needing to be at a place, well, there was a part of me that wanted to hide under a sofa for four years, and I realized that that would be, um, I think, really largely, and I say this despair is kind of the right of the privilege, that we needed to go out and really fight for vulnerable communities given what was at stake. And I wanted to be somewhere where we could make sure that in this time where it felt pretty clear that all of our communities were going to be attacked, that the progress uh, significant that had been made in the last several decades around issues of racial justice and inclusion, while highly imperfect, um, that there was a place that would be able to make us more than the sum of our parts, that we, could, that we could be kind of a place at the leadership conference to be a force multiplier across our groups and communities because we knew that in this moment, which I do believe has been a crisis moment and we are living still in a crisis moment, we would need to really marshal um, all of our voices to, to fight for voting rights, to protect LGBTQ communities, to protect dreamers and immigrants given how viscerally anti-immigrant the, um, the administration has been. And I will say that as, you know, we'll have more of a conversation about this, but I, I realized that in this moment when I joined the leadership conference, I had worked with the leadership conference when I had been at the ACLU and LDF, um, and the goal is to be able to come together on strategy and kind of deploy all of the, some groups have ground game like Move On and, and the ACLU, some groups have litigation power, some groups are, have a ton of congressional power, some groups are really in the states helping to build power and public will for the kinds of things we want. But if we could come together and we knew that Washington would be a largely defensive resistance posture, we needed to be a strategic hub for the resistance, while also figuring out how do we keep momentum going at the state and local level around issues where there had been really kind of important change. We didn't want the federal government uh, to slow that down in areas of criminal justice reform, enacting automatic voter registration and things that were actually moving in the states. Um, but look, just to close out on this question, I think that one of the things that we had to do was we couldn't be everything to all people in this moment as a coalition, that we weren't going to win by kind of being diffuse and issuing 20 press releases after 20 attacks on our communities represented by the leadership conference. And we really did some quick thinking 
in real time in 2017 about what it would mean, what we needed to focus on. And at that time, and still to this day, we have really centered our work on fighting for some of our democratic institutions and democratic norms. And it feels abstract and wonky, but actually without the courts and a fair and independent judiciary, without the census, which I say is the least sexy, least sexy civil rights issue and yet is one of the most important for structural democracy, without voting rights, everything else that we care about from criminal justice reform, to educational equity, fighting for economic security and healthcare, we have no place to go when these institutions are under so much attack. And so that has been some of our focus. And to me, there is a cycling in and out of history through, through our history where groups have really had to center the fight around democracy, even as we have tried to protect the most vulnerable communities amongst us. Maybe I could put a similar question to you. Uh, so this question, are we, are we in the moment of crisis that is certainly one of our dominant public narratives sort of seen in a broader historical trajectory, maybe in the trajectory uh, that you cover in your book, the last 40 or 50 years, um, maybe thinking back to a little of your own family's history, uh, a family with a deep history in the civil rights movement of the 60s and 70s, and particularly, I guess, in the area that you really think about and study, which is criminal justice, and in a moment like this, it seems like we have some competing narratives about where we stand uh, in criminal justice. We're at a moment of promise, a moment of crisis. Sure, Th um, and thank you for inviting me. And it's so great when I saw that, that Vanita was gonna be coming, I was so excited to join this conversation. She's somebody that I've watched her work in the, in the government and over the last couple of years. And she's such an amazing figure, y'all are, lucky to, to ha we're lucky to have her here on campus, so um, I'm really excited. I, I mean, I think in the area that I work in, you know, in the criminal legal system, I don't think there's any question but that we are in a much worse position um, as a country, um, and in particular, so for all of us, but in particular for poor communities, in particular for black and brown communities, um, it's, I normally have the story of, of progress because for the most part, I think it is true that on matters of racial justice, um, as flawed as um, we are as a country, it is largely a story of progress. However, in this area, we are, is one of the areas where things are worse uh, than they were before Brown. Things are worse than they were before the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. And I don't say that lightly, because like I said, in most, in most ways, I think that is not true. But in this area, it is true. Um, we, uh, you know, if you're, um, if you're a black man who is born in my generation, you are four to five times more likely to go to prison in your lifetime than a black man born in my father's generation. And we don't have that same data for African-American women, but um, all of the, uh, all the data we have suggest similar, that similarly would be true. Um, and so um, I think that when you say that there are competing narratives, I think it's true that in the last couple of years, um, we've started to see, in part because of the work uh, that Vanita has helped to lead, but we've started to see um, a bit of, of relief and a bit of progress. Um, I think, in, to my mind, maybe the single most significant thing that has happened in my area is the um, reenfranchisement of 1.4 million people in the state of Florida with felony convictions, the largest uh, reenfranchisement that we've had um, since the Voting Rights Act. Um, and that puts together, that pulls together two of the areas um, that, that Vanita has been talking about, both democracy and the criminal legal system. But, but, the, but we've had a 20 year crime decline 
And in that 20-year crime decline, we've only had a very small decline in the size of our prison system. Um, and so we're continuing to have people cycle through uh, our prison system, despite the fact that the country has gotten so much safer. And so you would think that some of the politics um, of crime would have changed. And so what I fear, what I fear about for my issue at this moment is that for the period of time I was writing about in my book, for basically the 70s, 80s, and 90s, the project of building more prisons and getting harsher and more punitive was an affirmative political project. The, you know, William Barr, right, authored a paper, The Case for More Incarceration, when he was the Attorney General. So this wasn't, this was conscious. That isn't the case anymore. For the most part, there isn't the same political project. People aren't running in the same way on that kind of project. But what's happened instead is that it's become entrenched and it's become taken for granted. So it's just become part of how it is that we have so many people locked up. So I fear that crim the criminal legal system is becoming like segregation. Segregation was something that people fought for. Then they stopped fighting for it. But it's still, but now we just take it for granted. Our neighborhoods are segregated. Our schools are de facto segregated. And we just live with it. And I worry that the same thing is ha it has happened uh, in this issue. Well, I want to get to some of these uh, policy questions. But there's, there's a word that's come up already, which is this idea of progress. Um, and whether you know, historical progress is a useful way of framing the history of the United States in the last, say, since 1950, since the founding of the Leadership Conference, uh, since the era when your book begins, or if we need to think about uh, other stories. I think Americans are very attached to the idea of progress. I think liberals and progressives in particular are very attached to that as the kind of grand narrative of the American past. Um, and yet, I, it seems to me that that sort of sets people up to be shocked when something like the election of Donald Trump comes along, when things start happening that don't fit into a kind of progress narrative. It's hard to wrap your mind around where that comes from. Um, it's hard to uh, think about an analytic framework that's going to substitute for this idea of progress. So I'm just wondering in your, in your, uh, in your own writing, in your own work, sort of how you wrestle with the idea of whether, whether progress is a useful framework, um, how we measure whether we're making progress, and particularly at a moment where, uh, as I said, many people would say we're at, we're at an end of progress or we're at some, uh, some, some, some moving backward. Now, I don't know that history has a direction, but I just wonder how you think about that issue uh, and experience it in your own, in your own work. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, so progress, there's nothing at all linear about progress, and progress can mean so many things. I think right now, I mean, there was a lot of time in my first two years when people just felt this sense of despair and kind of bleakness, and they felt like anything that they had done was worth nothing because look at where the country was, look at who voted for this president and, and the like. And I, I do actually think that it is important for us to not ignore that this country was born out of slavery. It was, we lived with systematic Jim Crow laws. It doesn't, we are a deeply segregated, in fact, a resegregated uh, country today. But, but I don't want to kind of, I have like a, maybe it's like that, I don't want to dishonor kind of what people went through before in this, but I, I agree with James about the fact that on issues like mass incarceration, we are much worse off today than we were before Brown. And that the legitimizing and, and the kind of normalization of a criminal legal system that we have had for 45, 50 years in this country is, um, is a really disturbing thing because it doesn't fit the narrative of progress. It doesn't fit the narrative of us kind of moving in one direction. I mean, some people are like, okay, you move, take two steps forward, you take one step back. We've got a history in this country where we've had signs of making progress followed by deep uh, 
uh, retrenchment and backlash. And so I don't, I don't think that we're kind of, we may have a North Star. I'm a civil rights lawyer, so I am a deeply optimistic person. You cannot do this work unless uh, you have a sense of optimism that you are driving to ch towards change and that the only thing in this country that has ever made a difference is people believing in the, in the possibility of change. And I think this country has seen a lot of change on a lot of issues, but we can't be naive or Pollyanna-ish about you know, where we are today. And, and in a lot of ways, look, the forces that were marching out in broad daylight with torches lighting up their faces in Charlottesville, those forces have always been uh, around in this country. And what we're seeing now is it, you know, uh, kind of a much more visible um, coming out of the darkness around these forces such that there are people in the White House who, who occupy and take and have hold white supremacist views and are advancing a white supremacist agenda in a way that frankly gives, we've been screaming about this in the areas of voter suppression and you know, people are all like, oh, you guys are conspiracy theorists. And I, I mean, I was telling James, I testified last week before Congress on HR1, which is this massive democracy reform legislation. It's on everything from money in politics to restoring the Voting Rights Act. I mean, you name it, it's, it's like a very aspirational bill. Um, and the next day, Mitch McConnell says, well, this bill is just about the Democratic Party trying to grab power. They're trying to have you know, an election, a federal holiday for, for voting. And I was like, you just basically laid bare that your whole premise for, the, for your party is to prevent people, that it is, well, I should say that, that they survive and exist by suppressing the vote. They do not want people to vote. And it's a, we have to recognize that as much as things change, they also have, you know, there's a way in which the kind of, the, the moving away from having it be overt and out of the open to then having, being filled with proxies and terms that seem like innocuous and neutral to now I think we're being a little bit put back to a place where we can say, guys, this is what we have been talking about for so long. And y'all never, you thought we had made the straight line from, from Jim Crow to, um, to where we are today when actually the very forces that have long been existence to suppress the vote for African Americans, Latinos, and others, we are now seeing through the kind of, in the last two years, all of this kind of become much more visible to, to the American public in a way that frankly, I think is important and helpful and in a way that progressives have largely taken for granted. I just wanted to pick up uh, on something that Vanita said about being a civil rights attorney and being optimistic in, in, in part in response to your question about progress. And, and, and I agree with that. I mean, I think, I basically think there are two ways that you keep going in this work. Um, and one of them is what Vanita said. One of them is um, the optimism. Um, and, but there is another one as well, and I think that, that I want to raise up. Uh, I, when I was in law school here, uh, it was long enough ago that there was a guy in L.A., a, a motorist, a driver, who was beaten to within an inch of his life by the Los Angeles Police Department. And it was caught on video. His name was Rodney King. And it's hard for students today to understand but this was the first time any of this, this, this was ever caught on video. The first time. Well, I knew it happened, talked about it, stories, but it had never been caught on video. And at the time, at this law school, I and other members of the Black Law Students Association and basically everybody in this country who was talking about this issue said, well, of course those police officers are going to be convicted. But the problem is what happens when it's not on video? And then, of course, they were acquitted. And we were stunned, and LA goes up in flames, and I am devastated and thinking about dropping out of law school. Because I had gone to law school to try to make, make progress for my people, and now at this moment where the, I'm, and I'm learning the rules so that I can use the rules on behalf of poor people and oppressed people and people of color, and now at the moment when you actually need the rules, it's shown to be a total sham. And I was 
completely demoralized, and I went to talk to my dad. My dad was in the civil rights movement. Um, uh, Beverly made reference to it. My, both my parents were. They were in SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And my dad had been beaten by the LA Police Department in the 1950s, and he wrote about it in his book. And so now we're in the 90s, and the same thing is happening, and there's still no recourse in law. And so I go, I'm talking to my dad, and I'm like, Dad, it's all a sham. Forty years later, nothing has changed. And my dad's normal move in those moments was to tell me the progress story. <laughs> but this time, he said something different. And he made a point to me, which I've always taken with me because I sit it alongside the progress, the optimism story, when I need to keep going, which is he said, look, when we were fighting, when we were marching, when we were being beaten in the movement, we weren't doing it for tomorrow. We weren't doing it for our lifetimes. We knew that in a country that has had slavery and Jim Crow for as long as this one has had, which is to say 85% of our country's history, right, 1619 to 1954 or 1619 to 1965, pick your year, <clears throat> we knew that we weren't going to defeat it. Now, we were fighting for tomorrow, and he said we were fighting for 10,000 years from tomorrow. And the point that my dad was making that I've always taken with me is you fight, sometimes you draw inspiration from the belief that you are part of a narrative of progress. And sometimes you draw inspiration from the fact that Fighting injustice is how you remain human. And so for me, I always put, when I think about progress, I think of progress and then, or optimism, and then I also think of humanity. I feel like fighting injustice, even if you aren't going to win or don't know if you'll win or don't know if you'll win in your lifetime, is about holding on to your, to, to your humanity. Can I... Is, I I, I have felt this so many times over the last two years, and I have felt a, in so many times in the last two years, kind of a deep insufficiency as a leader when you just felt like you could show up on the street with like 10,000 people, and I've been a part of a lot of marches in the last two years where we did that, because you just, you feel like you have to show up for humanity. I mean, the family separation issue was kind of the most visceral, one of my lowest points in the last two years, and there have been a few. Um, but this thing about that there, for me, I mean, this is a different version of it, and other predecessors of ours have said this, but that there is hope in the struggle even when you know you're gonna lose. Because the sheer process of organizing and trying to show up for other human beings who are being tortured or um, having their children grabbed out of their arms at the southern border with a Congress that has completely been asleep at the switch with state lawmakers that are supporting this agenda with, you know, and in those moments where it wasn't that we showed up 30,000 strong in Washington, D.C. at the end of June because we thought this was going to end family separation at the border, it was almost there. It was like we had nothing left to show to, to display our power in that moment. And we had to do the thing that we knew what to do, which was to organize and like take to the streets. Um, and that feeling, I mean, you got to understand, I came from having subpoena power at the Justice Department. <laughs> I mean, I was like, you know, showing up at police department to feeling the sense of like deep powerlessness in the face of incredible inhumanity and outrage. And so this thing of what you're saying is so deeply resonant to me today in a way that it never was even before, uh, even when I was at, you know, outside of government. It's a real thing. And to me, the day we stop doing that, because we will lose repeatedly. And, both you and I know of the legions of people who fought and lost repeatedly. 
But that's the hope piece that then gets tacked on, which is we aren't just fighting to win. Yes, we're fighting to win. But a lot of what we're fighting for is to keep that struggle alive, because the, that that, the day that we start to become complacent about that, or the day that we say, you know what, we can't win. Let's throw our hands up and do something else to me is a very destructive place for us to be. But it, it's not to say that it isn't hard emotionally to live in that space. Yeah. Um, but that is, I think, some of the lessons. And I feel like, you know, the last few years, you are seeing millions of people who never before thought of themselves as activists who felt the need. They, they woke up and said, "What? wait, this isn't what I thought this country was, even though a lot of folks of color knew that this country was exactly this. But they said, you know, we need, a, we need to in some way figure out how we are engaging um, to try to struggle to make a difference, even though we will lose a thousand times. And, you know, to me, even that gives me hope. I wonder if we can build on that, and maybe move a little from the, from the heart to the head. And it seems, you know, no matter really what your politics are or where you're coming in on these issues, one of the challenges of this moment is that there's so much happening, right? There's so much happening all the time that we see a real dispersal of energy. I think you talked a little bit about despair as one, uh, as one possible outcome, but um, there is a kind of impulse to action for a lot of different people in a lot of different ways, and then a real confusion about what kind of action is actually going to be the most useful form of action. Is it going to be um, going to law school, uh, learning to work within the court and justice system, uh, dealing with litigation? Is it going to be showing up to a protest? Is it going to be uh, working for particular candidates? Um, so I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how you see, I guess I would call it the strategic landscape maybe, or at least the political landscape, but both sort of where you think the points of intersection and useful energy are at the moment, and also, I guess, a little of how you have made those decisions in your own life when you're being pulled, uh, in, in both of your cases, in so many different directions, and you're addressing things that seem uh, really so, so large. Uh, I, so I've thought this is a really important question, and I've thought a lot about it. I spent a fair amount of college and probably most of law school, and I suspect um, uh, Vanita will be able to say the same, d were d debating among my friends and in my own head really two things. Like, what was going to be the issue that I was going to take up, right? Because especially in law school, like, you graduate law school and you you're going to start a job, and it's going to be in an area. You know what I mean? Like, you may be interested in a lot of things, but, like, <laughs> you're going to become an environmental lawyer or a voting rights, like, even within the public interest realm or a public defender. Like, you have to pick a topic. <laughs> um, it's a challenge for everyone in this room. I no, I know. And so that's why I'm, t I'm trying to share how much I rest. So one was that. Um, uh, I mean, I remember I was in law school with Van Jones, and I remember Van running around then talking about green jobs and like environmental racism in the, in the early 90s. And he was like, that's the thing that we need to be wor right, working on. And, he, and everybody was trying to figure this out for themselves. And then there's the question of like methodology. Right, okay, so now you've got your area, but are you doing direct service work? Are you, uh, are you filing lawsuits? Are you doing impact litigation? Are you going into government? Are you doing direct, you know, uh, uh, organizing? And, oh man, I came up with like, well, I remember we came up with different, like we would come, I came up with names of like organizations, like education, <laughs> action litigation for struggle like we were like at our nonprofits they had like terrible names but we were trying to capture all the 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 the, the modes of action in addition to the topic so uh, here's i guess where i am now here's where i i got at the end of law school and i've remained there 
my thinking has pr remained pretty firm since then. There isn't a most impactful, there isn't a most important topic, and there isn't a most impactful methodology. You need to be, you need to like, which doesn't mean you can skip over the top of like, you skip over the step of, step of wrestling through all of this for yourself. You have to. Mm -hmm. But in fact, there isn't a most important area and there isn't a most impactful methodology. What there is going to be is the one that's right for you. And that's not, it's truly not a cop out. What I mean by that is there's going to be an issue that is going to grab you. You're not going to be able to go to sleep. Like you are going to be thinking about this thing all of the time. It's going to be the thing where you feel like you aren't going to be fully human if you're not working on it. And there's going to be a methodology that's going to connect to your particular skill set and abilities and interests. Like this is where I think the head and the heart really are connected to go back to, because, because at the heart level, you, some people want to be sitting in, like in, in the jail for hours a day talking to people and then going and driving out into neighborhoods and talking to families about their struggles and pulling those facts together to bring it back to like a pleading that you're going to like knock out in 30 minutes because that's all you have. Other people want to kind of read, read reports and cases and reflect on them and, and file lawsuits. Other people want to like want to, 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 to lobby, and you, and you got to figure out which person you are, and then you put those two together, the issue that you can't stop thinking about, and the kind of person you are, and that then for you is your work, and you just got to know you're going to let some things go. There's going to be some topics that you're not going to be able to work on, and there's going to be some methodologies you're not going to be able to pursue. Van might have been right. Maybe I should have done environmental, you know what I mean? Like it's not any less important than criminal justice reform. But there was one that spoke to me in a particular way. And for me, there was a way that I wanted to fight it, which was as a public defender in the trenches, in courts. And that was right for me kind of at that moment. And then later on, I thought about it right in a different way, in a more kind of academic way. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm trying to find points of disagreement, but I don't, I don't have them. I, I mean, I think that that's just, I think that's real. I, I, I mean, I think the piece that you ended with is important, which is you may go in and out of a lot of mm -hmm. issues and sectors. I mean, it's one of the beauties and privileges of this education that you're getting here and where you may end up going is, I mean, I have worked on a lot of different issues as a public interest lawyer. Um, I am not litigating now. I, I think you can kind of become very attached to the tactic that you are working on. And I will say the funding industrial complex makes it such that you're supposed to kind of elevate your one tactic or your two issues as being like the end all be all that solved the poverty crisis. But when in reality, there really isn't. I mean, you look at criminal justice, uh, and the folks that are working to transform the system, there are people running to be district attorneys, right, more recently, which is not something that I ever grew up thinking was a, a path of resistance to. Um, there are folks that, as you said, are working in the state legislatures, there are folks that are litigating, you know, and there are a lot of, for a lot of folks, they're working on those issues and using that tactic and thinking this is the one that is going to transform the whole thing. And the reality is it takes, it takes a, all of it. Um, these problems are serious, deep, and entrenched. They're not going to get solved overnight. And, but the, you know, going in and out and using a variety of tactics, I think, I mean, there's some people who just like, they're, they are doing it for 35 years and good, you know, God bless them. They're kind of doing the same thing and they've been righteous believers. I've, I never thought I would be in government. I've spent my whole life suing the government. And yet, like when I had this mantle just weeks after Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, to oversee the Ferguson Police Department. I mean, I kind of, it was very odd for a little while to be inside government in having a different set of responsibilities around these issues than I did when I was at the ACLU. But both the inside and the outside 
tactics or it's like strategy, I should say, were really important to, um, to being able to make a dent in the problem of, um, of over-policing and, and force and, and the myriad of problems that we face as a country. So I, you know, I think that you want to look for places that fit the place you are in your life um, and be open and flexible to moving on when you feel like, okay, well, I want to become an organizer now because I did this. I litigated for the first 10 years representing people who had been wrongfully convicted or convicted um, uh, in the criminal legal system and particularly in the drug war. And at a certain point, you know, we had some great successes and victories, but every victory that I had as a litigator just felt like this, like, drop in the bucket against this tsunami of, you know, in the Texas case that you referred to, Beverly, I mean, yes, we won these great high-profile exonerations, but at the time, Texas was spending far more, more money on building prisons and on higher education. And... I didn't, the exonerations were a useful story to try to push reform, but I ended up really wanting to focus on changing laws. And that tinker, it felt, I mean, people need representation, but I had decided at that 10 years on that I wanted to, to kind of do organizing and policy work. And so, but I do believe that it is important both to feel like you are doing work that you find is actually meaningfully about creating change, and you want to be strategic. I... You, there, and there, that means a lot of different things to different people. But, um, but I think you want to think about how, how do you fit in the, broader, in the broader kind of movement for justice if you decide you're going to do justice work. What is your purpose? And understand with some humility that you are approaching it from a particular vantage point and others are trying to change it, you know, from they may left flank you, they may be more kind of middle of the road, but what is the... How do you work with, with folks, and what is your strategy ultimately to kind of push even the limits of your own tactic to achieve change? Uh, and don't be satisfied with the four corners of whatever tactic and approach you take. Mm -hmm. can, uh, sorry, can I just say just one more thing? Because I said, I, I, I want just to, to say, I do think there's one way in which like you have to like there's a I, I I was saying there's all these different choices right and you have to find the one that's right for you but there is I think one way where there's actually kind of right and wrong uh, choice or way of thinking about it and um, and I just I do want to just finish with that which is that I think it's crucial remember my I, I, I remember my mom talking mom, so my parents both parents were in the civil rights movement so my dad's black my mom's white um, and I remember my mom talking to me about uh, people who had, who stayed in the movement over the course of their lifetime in the civil rights movement versus people that were there for like a short period of time, like they went to Mississippi Freedom Summer or they were in SNCC for, mm -hmm. for a year and then they kind of went and then they basically moved and that just stopped being a part of their life. And what my mom said was that in her opinion that it was crucial in the work that you had to be doing the work for yourself, not for somebody else. And she said, now when I say that, that's gonna sound like, it sounds like, wait, like, cause we're all, you know, public interest, public spirit, like we're working, you know, we, we're like, we're not selfish. Like the selfish people are the people that go and take, have like follow less virtuous paths than we do. But the point that she was making was that if you're doing the work, if you're doing social justice work for somebody else, like for the people who are supposed to be the beneficiaries of your action, then you're going you're gonna to get burnout, and you're going to get burnout pretty quickly, and you're going to get disillusioned. Because you're going to start to develop a mentality, which is that like the people that you're working for are supposed to be grateful for you. They're not supposed to challenge you. They're supposed to be lifting you up. After all, you're doing this work for them. And her point was, what she was saying was, that she was like, I, as a white woman doing this, I was doing it because I did not think that I could live in a society of this form of segregation and oppression and not be fighting. Like, I was fighting for myself and for my own liberation. And that, she was saying, she believed put her in a position that she could be challenged 
she could be critiqued. She could have people say, well, I don't like, you know, I don't like what you're doing. I don't want you to be part of this movement at this moment in this particular time. And she was much more open to that she, than the people that went into it with this mentality that they were, they were helping somebody else. So that's the one p thing I just want to, for me, I just want to end on, because I do think there, there is a right way and a wrong way to enter the work. Well, I have lots more questions that I could ask, but we do want to uh, take a chance to open up the floor to questions. There are microphones going around, and these can be uh, questions about particular policies, particular moments, um, continuations of the conversation we're already having. I should note that this is being recorded, so if you ask a question, you will be on record uh, in some amorphous way out in the ether as having asked this question, made this query. Um, but you can just uh, raise your hands, and a microphone will come around. Um, while you're contemplating, and while hands are going up, uh, I do want to ask a more particular question, which is about um, an area that we've already discussed a little bit, but is about sort of where we stand in criminal justice and criminal justice reform at the moment. And we talked a little bit about competing narratives of our moment, but I think there is at least one story out that there, we're at a real moment of possibility and of change, and that it seems to be one of the few areas where there's kind of some level of cooperative bipartisan work going on, um, and that also much of the work that is going on in this area um, is happening not at the federal level, where there's um, not a, well, there's a lot happening, but not a lot along those lines, although there's been some interesting recent legislation that you might want to talk about, um, but that this is something that people are doing at the local level, um, at the city level, at the state level. So I just wonder what your read is on where we stand around those issues. If you could picture out 30 to 40 years to, um, if it took, say, 40 years for a system of mass incarceration to build, can we envision a world in 40 years that looks radically different than that? Are we actually on a path to, to seeing that? And, and just kind of where, where we stand with all of this at the moment? Maybe we'll put it to start. start. Oh. Uh, I was hoping Benito was going to <laughs> I told you I was being strategic. Mm, ah, like, nice. Uh, I think that it is a moment of possibility, especially, as you were saying, Beverly, at the, at the, at the state and local level. So 88% of people in prison in this country are in state, county, or local prisons or jails. And 85% of law enforcement in this country is state, county, and local. So there's always a disproportionate amount of media attention placed on what happens in the federal government, just because, like, you know, the big papers are going to have multiple reporters in DC, and they don't have multiple reporters, you know, in, in every state capital. They, they, they don't have any in most state capitals. So what happens there uh, gets, gets largely overlooked. Um, but, but what's happening there is where the action is. Um, and although the progress, what I'll, what I'll say about the state, county, and local level is that the progress is slow, right? That is to say, the, you know, the incarceration rate, which peaked in around 2008, 2009, 2010, has only it has dropped consistently, but only slightly since then. So if you look at the line, it's sort of going up like this, and then it peaks here, and then it's sort of you know, going like this. So at the rate of decline that we currently have, I think it would be, you know, be another 150 years or something, the sentencing project has estimated before we would ever get down to where we started. And crime, meanwhile, is, is down to where we started. So you might be just say, well, we'd be justified in having these kind of incarceration rates given our crime rates. Um, so the, so, we're gonna, so m it's going to have to be more aggressive um, significantly. Um, and the other challenge is that the factors that lead to having the largest prison system in the world aren't the same factors that sustain it. By which I mean, now that the system has been built, there are a tremendous amount of structural vested interests in maintaining the system. Interests which, didn't, which I don't think are principally responsible for its creation. Um, but now they're there. Now there's jobs. And now they're, the people, 
responded, right? Uh, uh, unions and, and capitalism responded, and people saw, okay, now we have this industry, and so now there's a whole bunch of folks there that are fighting, even if they're not, again, engaged in mass incarceration as a political project, they're just engaged in mass incarceration as a, I need to keep my job, or my business needs to continue to make money project. And so that is that has made the attempts to push back, um, it, it's made it more challenging. Um, but I do think what I'll say is that though the progress has been slow, it is in one direction. That is to say, if you look at something like um, felon, uh, in, in giving people who are returning citizens and formerly incarcerated folks the right to vote, all of the momentum, all of the direction is in favor of reenfranchisement. We don't have, you know, it's not like we have 10, you know, five bills pushing for reenfranchisement and another five pushing for disenfranchisement. It's, ten, it's, eight, it's eight to zero or 10 to zero. Now it needs to be 40 to zero, right? That's the problem of it not being fast enough, but it is all going in that direction. So um, in my mind, it's an area that is very, very ripe for energy and activism and reform. And the one community that I'll say that I think needs to be where there is a strategic opportunity in this moment is um, working class and poor white communities who are outside of cities, who are in rural areas, who are in distant suburban areas. These are legislators, and I see it in Connecticut all the time. These are legislators that right now, if you talk, go to talk to them about the mass incarceration problem, they're like, oh, that, I'll just pick Connecticut. That's a New Haven, Bridgeport, and Hartford problem. They don't think it's their problem, and they're not voting for reform legislation, and they're who we need to win. But guess what? It is their problem. I teach in Connecticut prison. There's a lot of poor and working class class white folks in prison in this country. And right now, in part because the advocacy has had this racial dimension, and appropriately so because of the disproportional, disproportionate racial consequences, but in part because of the advocacy, this is a group of people that's been allowed to kind of pretend like it's not their, uh, their constituents. And the other thing, here's the thing that makes it very hard for some of those constituents to develop a voice. They've committed a crime, or they're the family member of somebody who's committed a crime, right? They feel a certain amount of shame and stigma about that. Now, that was true of everybody who was in the criminal justice system 30 years ago. But 30 years ago, before the analysis of racial injustice and the analysis of the new Jim Crow, black and brown prisoners and their families as well were feeling that stigma and that shame. It's like, well, I'm not gonna go down to the state house to talk about my problem because I'm a criminal. But now for communities of color, there's like a new, there's a way to talk about it as a racial justice issue. But for poor white communities, they still don't have that. So they still have the shame and the stigma without the racial injustice analysis and they're remaining quiet. So I think a real strategic moment would be to think about how to organize in those communities so that folks begin to lift up their voices because they're getting hammered by the system. Not quite as hard, but hammered nonetheless. But I think that the opioid crisis and the ways in which rural white America, I mean, it's a different paradigm around the opioid crisis than what was used around the crack cocaine. Uh, you know, epidemic crisis in the 80s. And everyone, I mean, I think there is a, even for some of the most conservative lawmakers, is a fairly clear understanding that the way, they may not, they may deracinate why that's happening, but that, it, that there is a different kind of more compassionate public health oriented response to the opioid crisis, which is largely, you know, affecting white rural America in parts of the country. and. I mean, I, I agree with you. I think that there's, to me, I, I'm both a deeply idealistic person, but very pragmatic. And when, when, to me, it was actually a struggle for civil rights advocates to feel comfortable in 2009 and 10 centering race in this fight because 
when we were in state legislatures, particularly in some of the red states that were actually pioneering some of the reform in places like Texas mm. and some other places, it was really largely driven out of the fiscal crisis because mm. states actually mm. have to balance their budgets in a way that the federal government doesn't. And I had real struggle. I remember sitting down and talking to Michelle Alexander, who you know at that time was writing her book, and I, I was just like, I can't go into the state legislatures and start screaming about the new Jim Crow, much as I believe it to be exactly what is happening in this country, to convince some of these folks to, to pass laws. And I want to bring these people on board so that we can change the law. They're coming at it for a different reason than I am or that we are. Um, but should we not like build these weird alliances to get it done? And the concern always was, and it, was comp it still is very legitimate, that these are like reforms that tinker at the edges, they're not changing the, the paradigm, but ultimately as somebody who's trying to get laws passed or trying to get them changed, these dynamics I think are really important. And what you're talking about in Connecticut I think is about like how do you actually both like build you know, I don't believe that you have to have a shared narrative and analysis right. to be working on a, on a campaign together. And, exactly. you know, I think sometimes you're going to have folks that are in it for a very different reason, a reason that you may not think is particularly important, but that where you know human beings are, are um, at stake and your issue is at stake and kind of the decency of humanity is at stake, and you build those alliances kind of being very clear-eyed about the limitations of that kind of partnership and coalition building. And so I think it's hard uh, when you're doing this work around criminal justice reform. I mean, look, I agree. I think there's tremendous, back in 2003 when I was working on these Texas cases when you were a public defender, I don't think, it just felt like there was like one trajectory. Like there was no, it, it was just so hard to see any change because every election cycle, these sentences would get ratcheted up and we were criminalizing more and more stuff from school discipline to immigration to you know, substance use disorder to mental health. And it was just one trajectory and it was like this way. And it was, you know, and, and so now, um, you know, we are seeing tremendous progress, but we have been challenged. And James, you've talked about this, that, uh, we are going to have to change how we understand crimes of violence and what we do to people who are tagged violent offenders. And that is a, even a lot of folks that are kind of in the reform space and movement are not ready to do that. But there is no way to get back to the 1970 rates and, uh, without kind of confronting the, the, the kind of really dramatic like elongation of sentences that are keeping people behind bars for the rest of their lives without confronting some things that have become so normalized for us in this country and, and deeply uncomfortable to, to change. And so, uh, you know, I think one of the things that has happened has been some recognition of the importance of depoliticizing criminal justice policy making and having it be, you know, evidence-based or more evidence-based, whatever that means. Um, but we have a lot of work to do to actually you know, confront some of the some of the laws that will need to be undone, and some of the responses that we've had as a country to some things that make us feel, you know, we all want to live in safe communities, and that are going to have to force us to confront what are solutions and how how can we deal with some of these issues with a very different response than a purely criminal uh, a purely criminal one, criminal legal one. Okay. Questions out there? Yeah, down here. Hi, first of all, thank you for coming and thank you for everything you've said so far, especially um, what you've said about trying to find your path in the larger field of public service work. That's definitely what's on my mind and a lot of people's minds right now, so I appreciate that. Um, but my question gets at what you've already talked about a little bit, sort of about the emotive context of your work, um, both personally and professionally. Um, the first thing is, um, I thought when you guys were talking about um, your motivations or how you keep going and a really, um, oftentimes difficult uh, line of work is I expected one of you or to comment on sort of the feeling of indignation or anger because that's something that um, I definitely have felt a lot on campus and in my personal life and myself and I was wondering if you feel that 
also, and if you feel that's a productive um, tool in the toolbox or whether that's something you have to overcome to do your work effectively, especially if you're, if you're building coalitions or trying to convince people that don't see the same way as you, because um, that's something I struggle with and I'd love to hear a perspective on that. And then secondly, um, how do you deal with apathy in others uh, for your issue, for the line of work you do? I know that, especially at Yale, um, and in my own friend group, in my classes, it's hard to sometimes convince people who feel like they have no stake in this fight um, to do something to get involved. Um, and for me personally, that's difficult to engage with. And I'm assuming that professionally you find that even more difficult. And so I'm wondering how those two emotions play into your work. Um. I feel angry a lot. Um, so I was about to say the same, <laughs> same yeah. thing. I mean, I, why, would we, why would I get up in the morning, honestly, if I didn't feel some level of anger about the state of the world? And um, <laughs> I know that sounds terrible. Don't call me on that. Because um, I'm like hope and change. And, but, but it's true. Like I, uh, I think it's of a piece. I think there are ways to be debilitated by anger. And to have anger basically push one to despair and inaction and then become an excuse for not doing anything. And that's where the apathy piece of what you're talking about really frustrates me. I, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. I find it hard. The hardest, I would rather be talking to somebody who is so righteous in their belief mm -hmm. against immigrants and against black folks and against folks of color than to be with somebody who is just apathetic. Because I don't understand, I just don't understand apathy. Like, I don't know how, like, what is in the person's <laughs> brain chemically that allows them to, like, just kind of, you know, I'm like, maybe I want some of that. But I don't, I just can't, <laughs> how can you not be angry, right? And so, and, you know, I feel like the day I stop being angry, I feel like the, that's the day I stop being human about, but I think it's what you do with the anger and, and I mean, James said this, there's a lot of different ways to deal with that feeling. And people choose different ways to deal with it. For some folks, it really is about like organizing from the outside. And um, you know, it's, it, there's, there's different, and for others, it's, it's about being in court and you know, filing the, the pleading that's gonna try to stop this policy or whatever. But I, I think they're both, anger is a, can be a very healthy emotion to, act, to, to action. The, the question is, what do you do with it? And I think after the 2016 election, there are a lot of people in this country that were angry about the results. But I, for my, my charge and the charge of so many of us in advocacy is what are we doing with that anger? And that's where like Indivisible was such an organic thing that happened where you, know, you hear the, the co-founders of Indivisible, Lee and Ezra, who I work with a lot, talk about that there was, everyone was like, how did we get here? How did we get here? And it just, the goal was to say, stop asking that question and like get organized locally to do whatever bit of change you want to do. And I, that has been, I think, a really important goal for advocates is to figure out how do you channel people's anger to productive and constructive action, whatever that may look like, whether it's you know, working at the local level or, or marching in the streets in Washington. So, um, but apathy to me is a really, um, I, I find I'm very challenged by apathy. And my goal then is to make people give a damn. And, and a lot of times to me, that's about telling stories about human beings. Who are the people behind these policies that are suffering, you know, and then you know, at a certain point, I'm like, I'm, I can't, I can't get through, and we'll, we'll move on. There's plenty of other people, but that's the thing that I, that I am the most challenged by. Yeah, I, I was going to say the same thing about anger, and just, I guess, so on. So there's the, so, so for me. So Vanita said, and I agree that anger is essential, and it can also be debilitating. And so for me, the way to keep it um, but not be debilitated is, is, by, is by action. So, you know, like I can be, like, you know, in court, sentences getting handed down, watching judges just be so callous to people, thinking about the structural, like, unfairness, the way that, like, nobody in the whole city Nobody in the system cared anything about my client. They did nothing for her. No agencies 
activated, mobilized, no resources deployed in, in her whole life when she was suffering. And now at this moment, when she's committed a crime, now there's no num amount of resources that we won't devote to locking her up. You know, that is, 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 is angering and it is infuriating. And so for me, the only way that I overcome it is by, by you know, uh, the civil rights attorney, Brian Stevens, is always talking about proximity. And, and, and I think, to me, that's exactly right. I, I, it's because when I'm working with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, when I'm talking to them, then that is actually, I feel more moments of love and grace and lightness and humanity then. And that is a lot of what then keeps me going because it's not, it's not just the issue, it's not an abstraction, it's this person. And tomorrow, I want to go to court, and I want to give her the one thing that she never got before, which was somebody who cared to his toes and was going to fight with every inch of his mind and heart to stand up for her and demand that the system look at her as a whole person in context, and so that, for me, is, like, is, is then how I overcome the anger. To, that's how I keep the anger from becoming unproductive. Um, and how you become in proximity with people is going to, again, be different depending on the kind of work that you're drawn to, right? Which is what we were talking about earlier. It doesn't have to be an individual in that one-on-one -on -one representation. Um, but I think it helps when it is when it is a person. I think for, for a lot of us, it helps when it's a person as opposed to an abstraction. And the thing that I'll just say about apathy, um, you know, kind of quickly, and um, that isn't, I feel like I have so many stories of my parents tonight, but, <laughs> but this, I really, like, my dad used to talk about this. Because my dad used to talk about how, how, <clears throat> how ridiculous it was the way the civil rights movement was portrayed in media and in film. Like we went to, the, we were watching this film before he died and I, we talked about it afterwards and he said, you know, I liked it, but what I didn't like about it was they made it seem like everybody was in the movement. <laughs> and that is, and, and, and he's like, that wasn't true. You know, Dr. King, you, you, as you all probably know, you know, Dr. King was deeply unpopular when he died. The March on Washington, which is the only part of black, black, black history that gets presented in clips and, and in mainstream media, during, even the March, on the March on Washington was unpopular when it happened. 60% of Americans said in a Gallup poll that they think it would hurt the cause of the Negro. Right? And you know, 250,000 people were there. But then a decade later, 10 million people were like, oh, I was there. <laughs> and my, what, my dad is say, what my dad is saying that I, for me is so important is he said, look, I'm not telling you this because I want credit for being there first. That's not the point. He said, I'm telling you this because I think that this history is demoralizing and demobilizing to your generation and to the next generation. Because you call, you have an issue, you call a meeting, and six people show up, and five of them were at the last meeting. And you're like, well, what's wrong with my issue? Because look at the movement. Everybody was there, millions of people in the streets. And so, so what his big point was is that you, is, it was that, is that as long as you are fighting the injustice, most people are not going to care. Most people are apathetic. Most people were apathetic in the civil rights movement. Most people were not marching. Most people were not doing anything. Most people were going on about their lives for good reasons or for bad. They were on the sidelines. And that is true in every movement for social change. And so for me, it's a little bit, helps me kind of get to Vanita's point where she was like, well, I tried and now I'm moving on. Like, that's the thing, you gotta move on and like get your people, but it's gonna be a relatively small number of you that are gonna create the social change that you're envisioning, and just know that. And don't be demoralized by the fact that you've got so few people at your meeting. Can I, just to add, because this is the grand strategy program, um, which sounds so grand, but I, to put a finer point on that, there's, uh, 
it's also like know who your audience is and what you're mm. who you're trying to convince. So I think Brian is right on proximate um, being proximate to the problem. But most people in this country are not going to meet the person in That's prison. Right. They're not going to, and so or they're not going to you know know the undocumented uh, child who was taken away from their mother. But the goal then is, as an advocate, is like. For some folks, it is about this broader mass, kind of producing mass outrage, and that's communication skills and going that route to figure out. And for others, it's about trying to target particular lawmakers or, or courts mm. and, or media outlets. And, but to me, always the way, even though most people won't meet this person, that's where it's like, whose story are you telling? You yes. still need to break through. And the only way, I mean, all of the criminal justice statistics showing the gross racial disparities and the number, I mean, we've all, all largely become inured to that stuff because we've been hearing, we grew up in it, it's been decades. But it's the individual stories we tell about the human beings behind this stuff. And, you know, I feel like so much of the criminal justice reform movement has been largely, I mean, now you have governors whose sons have this experience, Jared Kushner, whose father had this experience, Nathan Deal in Georgia, whose son, you know, and we may think, well, gee, thanks for not caring for 30 years until, but, or, you know, you're telling the story about the, the five-year-old kid who was torn away from their parents, and this person has a name, there's a photograph, it's incredible how much more effective, and that's a way to build proximity across yes. these divides. It is so much easier to have policies of demonization and dehumanization when it's just this, like the words on a page or the stats. And I, you know, ultimately sometimes you t it takes one story of a human being to break through decades of intransigence. And I think that's all part of strategy, too. It's about being authentic and real and making sure that you are protecting the person who's being, um, whose story is being told and that that person has some agency in how, they, how you're telling their story. But that's a really, that's how you can, we also have to build that proximity to kind of break that down since most people won't be, for the reasons that you said, James, are not going to go to their local jail or prison to actually get to know somebody. Okay. I think we have time for one more question, maybe all the way in the back there. Um, I just had a question because I feel like, I guess, as a young person who's like aware of, like, aware about issues of social justice reform, um, I think it's like easy to look back and kind of be like, these people ended up on the right side of history and like that was the truth. But I find personally to be in this space where like my truth is kind of amorphous because I don't really know like where it's going or what it's mm. like going to end up being. Um, but I'm still very dedicated to it and I still like hold on to it very strongly. Um, but I also do have this urge to kind of like change people's minds and I understand that their truths may be different. So I was thinking like in terms of the both of you, how do you kind of either get over that urge to change people's minds or accept that you can't change people's minds? Um, because I find that to personally be something like very discouraging. Mm -hmm. And if you can do it really quickly, we might have time for one more question. <laughs> I have not gotten over the urge of trying to change Me people's either. minds. I just try to change people's minds all the time, every day. <laughs> really, I mean, it's a totally honest answer. I, 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 that's just what I do. And I mostly don't succeed, but I just keep trying. Yeah, I, I agree. I sometimes worry that I'm in a bubble, though, that I'm not enough around people who disagree with me. I used to be much more in touch with people who... Or, I mean, I still, I still am working with opposition and pretty serious opposition, but I think there's a different danger, which is that you only surround yourself with like-minded people and you kind of forget how to be sharp in these things and have like the analytical tools. But um, I think we're, we're always trying to change people's minds. My, my thing though is you have to know, there was a lot of push after the 2016 election to like court, to move away from voters of color and go like start working on organizing the white working class. and. I, you know, I was like, you can't pivot, you can't pivot away. I'm not sure how much of Trump's base today, I mean, he was real when he said 40, per, you know, my base, I could shoot someone in the middle of Times Square and they're still going to be with me. Certainly seems that way for, but it doesn't mean, you know, so, yeah. so that's, I, I, you know, a bit of all of it. I don't <laughs> have the answer either. Um, but I think it's important to engage. All right, one, one last question. There were a couple of hands, maybe right in the center here. Let's see. 
both of them. Uh, All right, well, we'll you, take guys. both of them since you're close by. They want to answer both. Um, so thanks uh, to the both of you for coming. Um, Professor Gage, I think you uh, alluded to, or I think, I think you were alluding to briefly to the First Step Act um, that's going through the federal government right now, which is obviously insufficient in scope, but I'm curious to hear what the two of you think about um, its substance and whether these sorts of um, very centrist pragmatic bills are productive or whether they sort of um, have the effect that people on the right can say, all right, well, that's job done. You know, we granted 2,000 people clemency and now we're moving on. You want to pass the microphone back to the... Should I ask Go ahead. first? Okay. Um, so I did a lot of research on the census for an internship last summer, um, and I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what's at stake and um, what needs to be done to ensure a fair count. Great. Um, okay. I, so first step, I uh, just quickly, and then James should go, could go into it a little bit more. So the leadership conference um, opposed the First Step Act in the House, uh, which was earlier in the summer. And we did it to the consternation of a lot of our friends and typical friends and allies on the Hill, uh, including folks like Van Jones, who is not on the Hill, but um, had a lot of things to say about our opposition. and. Um, and we did it because we had been so deeply involved in, for years, crafting what was already a compromise around the Sentencing uh, and Corrections Reform Act, circa, and this push to have a bill, which in the House was completely back end, had a lot of problems around recreating racial disparities through the risk assessment instrument, giving Jeff Sessions too much discretion around release decisions, or a lot of problems around a whole host of technical things. And we felt like we needed to take a really principled position in standing back, but we were in a very difficult position. As I said, the Congressional Black Caucus was supporting it, Hakeem Jeffries was promoting it, Van Jones, and, uh, and we were accused of, well, you know, if this bill helps one person, you should be for it. And we were like, do you know how often Congress actually acts on criminal justice reform? Like, never. It had been since 2010, but like the last time that Congress had passed a bill. So we opposed it. We whipped the vote against it. We knew that there were more folks in the House that were going to vote for it. But we made a strategic calculation that we couldn't, and a principled one, that we were not going to stand for it. And what we were going to do, so at the time that we were fighting Brett Kavanaugh's nomination, and Chuck Grassley was the face of that, we were also talking to Chuck Grassley and saying, you can't move this bill in the Senate, because it's like a really crappy bill. And it, um, we can do so much better. And all of that work that we had done around trying to put front end reform and sentencing reform in it, you have to stand strong on this. And what we did was then work really seriously with the Senate, with folks like Mike Lee, with Chuck Grassley, and then of course with, especially with Senator Booker, who was kind of our voice in the Senate and Senator Durbin around putting as much of what was in circa into that bill, making pushing for retroactivity. And we did it, we pushed so hard that we held our support for the bill until 12 hours before the vote. Because we wanted to hold the civil rights communities and the Democratic lawmakers' feet to the fire. Look, the bill passed. It is a significant bill. I mean, there are, there are significant pieces of it. Is it going to get us to the promised land of ending mass incarceration? No way. It is much less than the Circa bill was, which was already a compromise. So we have a lot of work to do, and we have a Justice Department that has rolled everything back around criminal justice reform and has refueled the 1980s policies, and Bill Barr will 100% keep it that way when, if and when he gets confirmed next week. Um, and so that was the positioning and some of the strategic choices we had to make. And now I talked so much and I need to get to the census, but let no, me- No, do, do the, sen do the okay. census. Um, <laughs> on the census. So the reason why I think it's like one of the most consequential issues is, you know, every 10 years, the federal government, it's written into the constitution. It's the one government program that is written into the constitution. The government has to count every single human being in our borders, regardless of status, regardless of race, regardless of whatever. Uh, and it is the basis for political reapportionment in the House of Representatives. It is the basis for the distribution of close to $800 billion of federal money to every community in the country for health care, for education, for policing, for every, for every kind of bread and butter issue that, that um, relates to our, our lives. And uh, in 2021, just as it was in 2011, it is also the basis for state redistricting, which governs how state legislatures allocate power 
Um, and this is a hugely consequential thing that happens in our country every 10 years. Uh, it is supposed to be a nonpartisan thing. And as some of you may know, very quickly, Secretary Ross, who's the Secretary of the Commerce Department still to this day, somehow don't understand why, he, is, he decided to add a question about citizenship status to the census in March of last year. He did it uh, using a ruse of asking the Justice Department to send him a letter saying that the Sessions Justice Department needs uh, citizenship status data to enforce the Voting Rights Act. Okay, I was responsible for overseeing the Voting Rights Act for two and a half years, as were all of my predecessors for in Democratic and Republican administrations before. Uh, since the enactment of the Voting Rights Act, never has there been the citizenship question on the short form of the census. This is the same attorney general who said that the Voting Rights Act was intrusive. So it was immediately known to be a ruse. There is litigation around the country. You can all imagine the level of fear that exists around uh, reporting data to the federal government. We've all seen what ha is happening to the Dreamers, and we're fighting uh, like hell to make sure that they can stay in the country with legal status. But there is a lot of litigation. This is a perfect example of a situation where it's going to take litigation, although we've, there's some great a great court decision, but I don't have confidence in the Supreme Court. There's a congressional strategy. There's an organizing strategy. The leadership conference has been really deeply engaged. But it is something that will shape all of our lives for, um, for the next 10 years uh, if we don't get this right. And it's why it's so important. Steve Bannon and Chris Kobach lobbied to have this question added. Uh, and there is nothing more that they would like than a systematic undercount of communities of color because it will radically affect political and economic power of our, of our communities. And so it's why I feel so passionately about it. I think that's a good place to end. <laughs> Oh, sorry. No, no, seriously. He wanted you to have the final word. Yeah, yeah, you're our guest. They can find, I'm, I'm in the law school. I'm, I have office hours. He's seriously. readily available. He's just oh. a Yale professor. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is Benita Gupta, y'all. Well, please join me in thanking both Professor Foreman and Benita Gupta for this fascinating conversation.